Hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the LBC Radio host Ian Dale and the former Home Secretary Jackie Smith. Good to see both of you. Hello to you. Front pages then, first of all, starting with The Telegraph. It reports that a group of British entrepreneurs have joined forces with senior political figures to campaign for the UK to leave the European Union. The Eye also has that story suggesting that three of the UK's biggest donors will bankroll the campaign to take the country out of the EU. The Guardian reports that Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt has pledged that junior doctors will not have their pay cut or working hours extended as part of any new deal. The Times leads with claims that fizzy drink company Coca-Cola has paid millions of pounds to scientific research and healthy eating initiatives to counter claims that its drinks help cause obesity. The Metro front page carries a photo of the man accused of the murder of PC Dave Phillips. The chief executive of the bank Credit Suisse is preparing to reveal a round of substantial capital raising, that's according to the Financial Times. The Daily Mail carries a demand from the brother of Leon Britton for Deputy Labour leader Tom Watson to apologise for accusations that he made against the former Home Secretary. But there's the express, <coughs> as you can see, a group of superfoods with anti-ageing properties could help protect against cancer. That's the front of that uh, paper, The Express. Daily Mirror leads on TV star Bruce Forsyth. He's reportedly hospitalised after hitting his head after a fall at home. And the Daily Star has a story on the trial of the man accused of killing schoolgirl Becky Watts. So let's get the thoughts of Ian and Jackie, starting with the, uh, the Brexit suggestions, exit from the EU, top of the page. What's interesting about uh, this story is that, I mean, I'm slightly losing track of all these different um, out campaigns, but the interesting thing about this one is it clearly has some big money and some big spenders behind it, and it also has... Uh, donors from across the political spectrum. So it has Stuart Wheeler, who's funded UKIP. It has John Mills, who's been a big uh, supporter of, of, and donor to the Labour Party. And it has a Tory whose name escapes me. Peter Crudders. <laughs> Peter Crudders. <laughs> um, she doesn't know them, you see. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, actually, this is, you know, that's going to provide them with the basis of being able to uh, campaign pretty hard. Mm. And, you know, I still hope that the uh, campaign for us to remain within Europe is successful, but clearly a lot of emphasis and money is now being put behind the out campaign. Mm. And that is, money is vital in these campaigns. If you think back to the AV campaign, the, the yes to AV people were always slightly hamstrung because they didn't have the level of funding that the no campaign had. And uh, I think this is going to be... It is important that both campaigns are reasonably well-funded because you don't want to sort of one to be... I mean, people want to hear the arguments, and so they've got to be put in a way that people can understand. That does cost money. Uh, if you want to do television advertising or sort of cinema advertising, even just printed stuff, you've got to have the money to do it. And Jackie's mm. right. These are serious people. And there are three out campaigns at the moment. Now, in right. the end... You would hope if, I mean, I'm sure people on that side of the argument hope that they will all come together to have a, a unified campaign. It doesn't, from Nigel, comment, Nigel Farage's yeah. comments after his conference, you might think that unless he leads it, uh, they, they might mm. not. Um, but I think there's a poll in this article that shows that 44% say, yeah, we want to stay in, 39% mm -hmm. out. Now, that's within the margin of error. So I think both... And in a way, that means that there should be a healthy debate because I think if it was 70-30 one way, um, that people wouldn't maybe take as much notice of it. Mm. I think some of the in-campaigners are worried about the potential momentum that's developing in the out campaign. Gordon Brown is quoted in this piece talking about the need to make sure that the in-campaign talks about the interests of Britain and I suppose takes a sort of positive, um, uh, takes a positive approach. But uh, these are campaigns, I don't think either of these campaigns will be successful if they simply depend on big money people or even yeah. major business leaders. They're going to need to build a whole range of voices and arguments in support of their campaign. Yeah, but the business question is important, isn't it? I know that this group, Vote Leave, has signed up some important businessmen. Indeed. The point being that we need to know as voters, whether it's good or bad for business in Britain. Isn't, isn't that part of the yeah, argument? Absolutely. And, of course, part of the argument that the Yes campaign has always used, which I, which I yes. share, is that there will be jobs and 
business potential at risk if we were to leave the EU. So the fact that the Out campaign have managed to get business people is probably mm. significant for them. I, I think it is significant because Nick Clegg always used to use the argument, oh, three million jobs will be put at risk. It's an absolutely ridiculous argument. I, I, I mean, some jobs may be, but then you could argue, well, if we're out of the EU and have, can come to our own trade agreements with the rest of the world, maybe that will create jobs. Mm. I mean, the, these are all the argu well, arguments we... that are going to be had. But I think the key thing is from both sides, they've got to present the positive arguments. Mm. If it's just about negativity and threats as to what could happen mm. if that happened, mm. I think people are going to be switched off by this campaign very, very quickly. Mm. Interesting. Um, let's move on to other matters, shall we, which is what's happening in Syria, uh, escalation of, of Russian involvement and uh, what we do next, really, isn't it? So the story, well, it's, well, it's not the, huge, is it? It's this one down here. That, that, there are two sides to this story now. We've got the Russians seemingly doing whatever they want in Syria, and they mm. also, well, why shouldn't we? The, the West is doing the same. Um, it's, I think it's de developing into a really dangerous conflict because, I mean, what if a Russian plane and an American plane come together in, or there's some sort of um, accident or deliberate attempt to blow something up that um, just spirals out of control? We think back to August 1914, and I'm not tr trying to sort of equate what's going on here with that, but there are, it's the law of unintended consequences. Bigger things can arise out of just small accidents. And today we learn that Britain is sending 100 military personnel to the Baltic states as part of sort of reinforcing NATO's position there. Now, I can see why they're doing it, but I think they've got to be very clear what the Russian reaction is going to be to this, because this could be Ukraine all over again. If the, Russia, the Russians could well say, well, look, here we go again, uh, NATO and the EU sort of threatening our borders, um, let, let's send in some people into Lith Lithuania or Estonia yeah, and see what happens. Sure, surely the point is it's to preempt Ukraine all over again, because Russia has not been backwards in coming forwards in uh, imperialist um, ambitions. Uh, in Ukraine and there is a lot of frustration so actually you know as Michael Fallon I think rightly said it's important for NATO to uh, strengthen the eastern the capacity if you like in the eastern part of NATO mm. and to demonstrate to people that it's worth your yeah. while being in NATO actually yeah, even when you're facing considerable aggression from Russians I, who frankly don't seem to be too bothered about I what the rest of the I world thinks. I don't disagree on. with that at all I think NATO has a vital role to play but there was a sort of, I think, an, maybe it's an unwritten agreement that NATO would not station people sort of on Russia's borders. Now, um, I think we've, we've got to be very clear about the implications of what we're doing yeah. here and what but, the possible long-term consequences well, Jack, you said might that, be. You know, Russia has imperialist ambitions in, in Ukraine. If you're, if you're in Moscow, what you're looking at is President Putin concerned about Western-backed regime change, both in Syria and mm. in Ukraine, and maybe thinking he might be next. Is that something that you know, gives legitimacy to his arguments, well, do you so, think? Well, it doesn't give legitimacy, but it might be a reason that there is that he is domestically concerned. He feels in a very strong position in terms of the support that he gets within uh, Russia. And you're right, I suspect, that he wants to maintain, certainly in his Syrian action, mm. he wants to maintain a strong partner or potentially to rebuild again a strong partner in the Middle East, uh, which is why, of course, he has resisted any attempts to um, get rid of Assad in Syria and why he is now actually there using his, um, uh, using his military strength to yeah. support him and, incidentally, not successfully tackling the ISIS threat. Uh, rather indiscriminately, the suggestion is uh, targeting all opposition to yeah. Assad, mm -hmm. regardless. So, you know, of justifying course, it, as you might expect, justifying it on the basis that this is an attack on ISIS. But in fact, the reality appears mm -hmm. to be it's the rest of the opposition that are being hit more hard than ISIS is. Yeah. So, if you're not careful, you end up in Syria with <coughs> Assad still there and ISIS, ISIS still powerful. Yeah, ISIS in the east, uh, Assad in the west. I was talking to um, Mary Dejeska, who used to be a Moscow correspondent for the Times, now writes for the Independent. Her view is that slightly more optimistic than this, and that she thinks that the, the key thing for Putin is not necessarily to keep Assad in post, but the key thing for Putin is to keep Syria as an independent state, a functioning state. And the, so the Moscow view would be, well, that has to be with Assad at the helm for the moment. Now, she seems to think that in the longer term, the Russians don't really care whether Assad is there or not. They just want Syria to be a functioning state. 
So whether that provides a sort of opening for maybe some sort of contact group yeah. to get together to actually keep a dialogue open between the Russians and the rest, because there doesn't seem to be much dialogue between mm. Putin and Obama at the mm. moment, maybe you get together some sort of group of wise people to, to actually act as an interim mm. sort of contact group in, yeah. in, in the meantime. Uh, let's move inside the Express, shall we? Uh Welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me this evening, Ian Dale and Jackie Smith. Lots to discuss we haven't got to. A quick mention of VW, of course, um, an appearance by the American head at Congress. Um, down the bottom there, VW emission scandal on the scale of Enron. And we remember what happened to yeah, that company. Absolutely. And um, what was unbelievable about this appearance was he did this sort of fulsome apology. Mm. And then he tried to claim that what happened was two software engineers had just turned up to work one day and thought, I know what we'll do. We'll totally distort the software in these cars in order to defraud the uh, regulatory tests on emissions. I, I just, I mean, I cannot believe that that is true. And almost trying to do it sounded bizarre. So, you know, funnily enough, I was out with my youngest son the other day and he just made some off-the-cuff comment about there was a funny smell in the air and he went, oh, it must be a Volkswagen driving by. And I thought to myself, that is how much you have trashed that company's yeah. reputation. Considering what a great brand it was, yes. trashed now. Mm. An untouchable brand in terms mm. of what people thought about it. Uh, let's move into the uh, Express, shall we? No, I won't go into that one just yet. Uh, Express page two, insulting Corbyn too busy to meet the Queen. Is this fair, do you think? Because a man's allowed to have a private well, life and have other... Well, not fair. <laughs> No, I agree with you. <laughs> I, I don't see this as a snub. I mean, as I understand it, Jeremy Corbyn has taken th a three-day mini-break somewhere. Mm. I mean, what a terrible thing for a politician to do. The last thing we want is to have knackered politicians. It doesn't matter whether they're in government or whether they're holding the government to account. Uh, and the, the thought in this country that politicians should be working 365 days a year, nobody else could do that and not get tired. Jeremy Corbyn, since May, has been going sort of full pelt campaigning yeah. and since he's been elected. Now, I don't share any of his politics, but I, on a human basis, I'm glad he's taken mm. a few days off. Now, if that means that he can't go to see the Queen to be inducted into the Privy Council now, well, I'm sure there'll be another opportunity because very soon. Because David Cameron took a while, didn't he? Of course exactly. There is nothing that says you have to go but on course... the first possible occasion. The trouble, however, you know, so I'm defending, uh, Ian's defending him even more strongly than I am, the problem, of course, is summed up by that picture. Mm. Everything now is seen through the prism of yeah. he didn't sing the national it's anthem. It's distracting, isn't so it? So I'm afraid that people are able to make smear. This is a smear, but they're able to make it yeah. because of that mistake it's, that It he isn't made. just a smear, because he was asked specifically, will you kneel before the Queen? To which he said, oh, I didn't know about that, I'll have to think about it. So even he is is not yeah, doing the traditional just, thing. You're right, he should have just said yes. I mean, we all have our views about the, the royal family, but you have a particular responsibility as a senior politician, which he's finding it a little difficult, I yeah. think, to translate at, into. At what he point, should have just said yes. At what point, you know, does Ali Pratt say, no, 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 we can't, we can't do that. You know, Jeremy's got principles. No, 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 we can't do that. He's got principles. You know, and that, that becomes the story, not what he believes and what he does. I mean, the alternative view of this is that he was playing to his own supporters, who clearly would agree with him. And so, actually, not going to see the well, Queen, they will think by, he's wonderful. I have to say, it depends what you mean by his supporters, Ian. I mean, I don't Trots. think that. Well, <laughs> I don't think the vast majority of Labour Party members even necessarily think that this is a good thing. They think it's a distraction. The, the, and certainly the vast majority of the people he needs to be his supporters if he's going yeah, to be Prime they Minister, don't care about the British that. Public. They don't care about that because winning elections for these people isn't actually that important. Sort of staying pure to their ideology is important. So his, his key supporters will be very pleased if, if they mm. see this as a snub to the Queen. Well, the vast majority of Labour Party members want... Even the some who voted... The vast majority of even old some, Labour Party members, even not these voted, new ones. Well... Even some who, even a lot who voted for Jeremy Corbyn, want Labour to be back in government again. I agree, there are some that don't, and there's too much of a loss of the importance of us actually winning in the party. But, and I think therefore they understand the significance of not getting distracted by stuff like this but actually focusing on the things that are really going to yeah. make a difference. We're running out of time, we've got lots to do. I'm just going to squeeze in the story that we, uh, that we trailed. A fifth 007 movie, I'd rather slash my I wrists, am, says Daniel Craig. I am pretty devastated about this, I have to say. I am beyond excited about going to see Spectre. Um, <laughs> I think Daniel Craig is a brilliant James Bond, but this marginally churlish 
right? He's had a pretty good, you know, he's had a good career, but he's, he's the highlight of his career has been as James Bond. And now he's saying, oh, I slashed my wrist rather than do another James Bond movie. Get over yourself, Daniel. Mm. Uh, we have enjoyed you as James Bond, but frankly, we can move on to somebody else quite happily. Bit, but Let's give with one hand and take with the other, like I think. It's a secretary you before you needed to. This whole... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, even, I'm not even going there. <laughs> um, lots of other stories we didn't get to, including Junior Doctor's winner we think on Pay From Hunt. He blinked first. Maybe we can talk about that at 11.30. We, we will see you then. Thank you both very much, Dean, Jackie and Ian. Uh, let's move on to other matters, shall we? Back to the eye. Um, the story that's one of the little banners down the bottom. Britain sends troops to Eastern Europe. Russia tensions escalate. This, of course, is fire increased missiles from the Caspian Sea into Syria, either landing or not landing accidentally on Iran. Who knows? But uh, what's your concern about this one? Um, I was looking at the map of the, where the Caspian Sea is, and it's actually quite a long way from Syria. So mm. it's hardly a surprise that some of these missiles have landed in Iran. But if you're firing missiles, Iran is probably the last country that you want them to land in because they're not going to be very pleased. Um, there are all sorts of concerns here. Uh, Michael Fallon's expressed some of them mm. today. In theory, the Russians getting involved in this might have been a good thing had they just restricted their sorties to attacking ISIS targets, but they're not. No. They're clearly attacking uh, the free Syrian army. Yeah. Uh, and that raises all sorts of questions because, in theory, again, you could have American, British, French planes uh, trying to defend those targets. So you've got a sort of ersatz war going on here with, with two big players fighting a, a similar but very different battle. And who knows how that could end? And it's completely right that they're not successfully targeting ISIS. That was their just, you know, that is sort of their justification. But actually, it seems pretty explicit that what their justification is, is to support Assad in mm. power against whoever might be ranged against him. And the problem is that potentially you're going to end up in a situation where actually there are only two groups who have remained relatively unscathed by this, and that is Assad, with all the terrible things that he's doing to his own people, and ISIL. And that would be a wholly uh, unfortunate, bad place mm. to end. Mm. It's not surprising, therefore, that Obama is worried and that NATO is concerned about that as well. Um, Dwayne Corbyn, will he, won't he kneel? Or will he, won't he meet the Queen to join the Privy Council? Subject of the uh, Daily Mail's piece here. Well, it is, but we were actually looking at that little bit up there. <laughs> this, this new group okay. that Jeremy Corbyn supporters I shall find it. have formed called Momentum. Momentum. Right. And it, it's basically a little bit like militants, people are saying. It's a party within a party. So its idea is to sort of bolster Jeremy Corbyn's support within the Labour Party. So when they write, people like Jackie start moving against him, they've got an organisation to fight back. Now, um, Stephen Pound, the Labour MP, <laughs> I spoke to him about this earlier, he was incandescent about it. But I said, well, hang on a minute, what about Progress, which Jackie's a prominent member of? Aren't they a party within a party, sort of the Blairites, mm -hmm. sort of trying to protect their position? Over to you. <laughs> it's wholly understandable that having built a very successful leadership campaign, uh, the people behind the leadership campaign will want to try and find some way to maintain that momentum, which is presumably the reason for the name. Um, what, what, and I don't necessarily think that it's wrong to have groups within the Labour Party that want to help to promote debate. What I worry about in the way in which momentum is describing itself, and this differs incidentally from progress, is that they're saying we're going to organise in every town, every village, every constituency mm. in the country. Well, the question mark is, what are they going to organise for? Presumably, they sh what they should be organising for is a Labour government. What some fear they may be organising for is to get rid of Labour MPs who they don't think wholeheartedly support Jeremy Corbyn. Now, Jeremy Corbyn has said, I do not intend to bring about compulsory reselection of MPs. He said it, he'd better jolly well stick by it, and he'd better Ooh. make sure that his supporters stick by it as well. Yes. Get her. <laughs> um, talking of the uh, Labour hierarchy, front page of the Daily Mail now say, sorry, Mr Watson, this is to the family of Leon Britton. This is a very complicated story. Um, Tom Watson has a lot of history with the Mail Group newspapers, so one should bear that in mind when one reads this story. Mm -hmm. However, they are quoting Sir Samuel Britton, um, noted columnist on the Financial Times, a brother of Leon Britton, and it does seem that uh, there was no case to answer in the case of Leon Britton, and yeah. his name has been traduced throughout the media because um, of the allegations that Tom Watson made in Parliament and the police investigation. What? So, hang on a second. On the face of it, therefore, Tom Watson does owe 
the Britain yes. family an apology. What he doesn't owe an apology for is for bringing up the, the more general case of child sex abuse in Parliament because um, some of the people that he has named or some of the cases that he's passed on to the police have resulted in mm. convictions. And, and this, this mm. whole area, we saw the, had the panorama on this the other night, this whole area is unfortunately developing into a, a scene where you either believe that everybody is guilty mm. or you believe that it's all a stitch up and that nobody is guilty. The truth is somewhere in between and that that's shows where the, the media have a difficult tightrope to walk here, mm. so do politicians and so indeed do the police. But the specific I, I policy here too is, oh, sorry, wait, is that his widow is angry that the police knew that yes. he was that's innocent of these rape charges exactly. Exactly. and didn't tell him before he died. Exactly. But that, and that, is and that is a different, different uh, to Tom Watson. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. The yeah. male have chosen, for the reasons that Ian has alluded to, yeah. to make this a criticism of Tom Watson. I think that is wholly wrong. What was Tom Watson, you know, Tom Watson as an MP, has done sterling work to ensure that the voices of victims have been heard in this. Was he really supposed to ignore uh, people who came to him and said, look, we're concerned about what's happened here? He would have been wrong to do that. The people who were wrong were the police in not telling the family more quickly yeah. that yeah. they were no longer pursuing we, we the allegations against yeah. Leon Britton. Just, just okay. very quickly, I mean, it is important. When an MP makes allegations like this mm. in the House, they don't do it lightly. And I'm no. sure Tom Watson mm. will have thought about this very, very deeply before he made the allegations. Yeah. OK. Lots more still to come, including cheerier matters, of course, because Northern Ireland have struck Euro gold. Back with that in just a moment.